Hi, I'm WBGO host Leslie Harrison. On November 16, 1992, Tony Bennett sat down for a chat with his friend Michael Bourne at the WBGO studios. Now, over 30 years later, both Tony and Michael are no longer with us, but the conversation stored in the WBGO archives all those years is available for you to hear right now. Special thanks to the American Archive of Public Broadcasting for providing the files. Please enjoy this exclusive interview from WBGO Studios. Talking with Tony Bennett, remember you telling me three, four years ago that we should name a hall after Sarah Vaughan, and indeed we have. And you know, yes, and I'm thrilled about that, and you know, certain things happen, like uh, they made me the Grand Marshal a couple of years ago, not this Columbus Day, but the Columbus Day before this, in Newark, and I was standing on the podium watching all the different bands go by, and and, uh, this nice happy day, it was a nice sunshiny day. And the mayor of Newark came by to just uh, acknowledge himself to everybody. And I had never met him, but I whispered in his ear. I said, I said, you have a great concert hall going up there. I said, and you're in Newark. I said, why don't you name it uh, the Cervon Concert Hall? And uh, he, he didn't say yes, he didn't say no. He just, but later on I realized I ran into Count Basie, John Williams and John, and Count Basie's band, Frank Foster's Count Basie's band. And uh, John Williams had a sweater and said, the Sarah Vaughan Concert Hall. And it just thrilled me, you know, because I, it's like Sean O'Casey, the great poet, said, every once in a while, somebody gets their licks in. Everybody gets their <laughs> licks in, you know. And uh, uh, it was a good sign. It was very gratifying to know because she deserved it, and it's a beautiful thought to call it the Sarah Vaughan Concert Hall. I think it's very, very correct. It's because uh, um, it's, there's such a latent attitude about the very best music in America being at, on the, in the back of the bus right now. You know, jazz uh, is really, I mean, you know it, uh, I know it, and a lot of people with ears know it, that it's just the best music that's ever come out of the United States. And it, it, this will be uh, tradition. The older societies in the, in the world know that they're only left with whatever they contribute to the world. And really, uh, ideally, on the billboard charts or anything like that, that kind of music should be uh, have first preference to ratings. And then everything else should follow up, whether it be, you know, reggae or, or rock or rap or country or whatever. It should go they should be in the back of the bus, and that music, jazz music, should be in right in the front uh, headline position. The American popular song is something that you have lived with now professionally in show business now for more than 40 years. Just celebrated your 40th anniversary a while ago. But you've gotten your licks in. <laughs> oh, yeah, my gosh. Well, you see, one thing it's, uh, it's given me is that I've been allowed to uh, combine business with pleasure because when you're doing Cole Porter songs or Harold Allen songs or Irving Berlin or Duke Ellington or, you know, you, if you're a singer or a musician, you're just floating on this wonderful music, this crafty, um, more than crafty, I call it artistic uh, you know, the music uh, the lyrics of Johnny Mercer or Yip Harburg or Ira Gershwin you really got something going for you. Frank Sinatra once said, quite memorably of you, that you were signed, autographed a picture to you, that you were the greatest GD singer, the American popular song. It's right there. Yeah. It's right there. I, th- I thought that was Frank, Sin- Frank Sinatra <laughs> peaking, and that was the picture. And now you've done this album, Perfectly Frank, all a tribute yeah. to the Torch and the Saloon songs. But these are also songs you've been singing for all these years. Yes, but um, but, you know, he was the chief motivator. I always call him the king of the entertainment world. I mean, I just can't believe how the marketing people have uh, kind of turned things around and devalued what's really uh, full worth, you know, like the Richard Rogers and Cole Porters. I mean, they're not, you know, years ago, uh, like I ran into a salesman recently at Columbia Records that was used to be one of the old pioneers when I first started in the 50s and he said, you know, he said, you made 
that label, Columbia, I said, well, you're just flattering me. I said, come on, you know, there's a lot of good artists that were on the label. He said, no, what you don't understand is, he said, they, when you were hot, when you were the Michael Jackson of your day and you had the 1, 7, and 5, and 10 record on the charts, everybody ran to the company and said, we want a Tony Bennett record. The, 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 the Broadway producers... So if there was a show like Kismet or, or Camelot or uh, uh, Bells Are Ringing, Julie Stein's Bells Are Ringing, or one of those shows, they would say, we want Tony Bennett to sing this song. Because in those days, they played my record. And they, for one month before a show opened, like a Cy Coleman show, they would, they would just concentrate it and play that record over and over again so that the opening night, when people came in to see Bells Are Ringing for opening night, when it got to the song Just In Time, everybody started applauding in the theater, which made everybody feel, hey, this show is a hit, because there's a hit song in the show. So we did that with Richard Rogers. We did it with uh, uh, Alan and J uh, Alan, uh, uh, Jay Lerner. Stranger in Paradise. Stranger in Paradise with Kismet, exactly. You know, So there were a lot of them. And then he explained to me, this salesman said, that when it came time for Sony to buy Columbia from CBS, that that catalog of those Broadway musicals, that and, you know, also the records of Duke Ellington and Leonard Bernstein's orchestrations, you know, and conducting, uh, that along with everything else went for $2 billion dollars. So while they say that, you know, it's, it's a catalog or something, a minimized catalog, when the final moment of truth comes, when they're finally dealing over the table, that catalog becomes their gold mine. Mm. It, 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 it costs $2 billion for Sony to buy that product because of the catalog. Did you, did you feel some sort of curious pride? <laughs> well, it just... Uh, you know, it's kind of old-fashioned American business. They say, don't tell him how good he's doing. He'll ask for a raise, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> and, of course, it's phenomenal today. That, right. uh, that's the one thing that I like about what's happening with new contemporary artists is just like sports. I mean, they're getting some deals that are unbelievable, you know, where Prince gets $100 million and right. Madonna gets $80 million. It's, you know, uh, it's almost like uh, in tennis, you know, you see a Don Budge, he must be in a, still in a permanent state of shock to find out what the tennis players are getting compared to what Rod Laver got in those days where they'd get on these little two right. scarf and goggle airplanes and go to Australia and the next morning go out and play tennis and just uh, make a very, you know, uh, kind of sensible income, but nothing phenomenal where they become independently rich. Yeah, but in that nineteen fifty three dollars, you did pretty good. In nineteen fifty three, I'm not complaining. <laughs> I, I, I believe me. I swear, I'm not complaining. I don't envy it. I don't right. envy it. I'm just shocked. Yeah. At inflation. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know what I mean? <laughs> Come welcome, on. You know? Welcome to I the world. I mean, I saw I saw Frank Sinatra at the Paramount Theater with Buddy Rich on the drums, uh, uh, Joe Stafford, the Pied Pipers, uh, Ziggy Elman on the trumpet, the, a great Tommy Dorsey band. Plus a movie like a John Wayne movie, and that was for seventy five cents. And that was tops. And that was that was like the top dollar. How could you get a better Not show than that? Dollar. Right? How could you get a better show than that for seventy five cents? Last night I went to see Dracula and it cost me seven dollars and fifty cents. Ten I'm not complaining. I can afford it, but I'm just saying, <laughs> come on, there's a lot of people at seven bucks to see a movie, you know. Let's so. talk some more about Frank Sinatra. What is it about him? What's what's he calls you the best GD singer. What is it about him that people think is the best? What do you think is the best about him? Well, without getting political, uh, everybody forgets God. And God gave him the voice. He's got a beautiful voice. It's so mellow, you know. It's so He gets into a tune, and it's not only his voice. There's a charisma about him. Like recently, the miniseries that they showed... It was so disappointing to me, you know, because it was kind of sleazy compared to the great Sinatra and what he really did. It could have been so much better, the miniseries, if it were a documentary of seeing him right throughout the whole uh, the, the two nights rather than having someone portray him. Because even though the records were nice that they played and the lip syncing was nice and the guy looked nice and all that, there's something about Sinatra, this charisma that comes out. It's a Jolson-esque 
thing. You know, you know that you see in Sinatra. I'm, I've seen him so many times in Vegas, but mostly I saw him in London, but I, mostly the Carnegie Hall. You know, when you see him at Carnegie Hall, that's the one place where musicians, they'll play everywhere, but they'll, when they're playing Carnegie Hall, you know, I don't care who it is, I've seen it. Their shoulders go back, and they're, man, they're playing Carnegie Hall. And the, uh, something else happens, an Aikido or a Zen type thing happens. You know, they come out and they play better than they ever played. It's, mm-hmm. it's a great hall to watch a performer in. And uh, I saw Sinatra give uh, many concerts. My favorite one was at Carnegie Hall uh, that I saw him. Uh, he gave one of those perfect, the next day in the New York Times, they gave it, they just said the guy's an absolute master, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, Vinnie Falcone was conducting in those days and had a great 75-piece orchestra and everybody came out in tails. And it was the most elegant evening I ever saw. Uh, any performer of popular music give. Uh, it, it's the old story. When Sinatra is on, you know, I saw it one time Sammy Kahn showed me a film that he did, a live uh, kinney of, of, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with uh, Joanne Woodward and what's her husband's name? The Paul Newman. Paul, Paul Newman. How could I you forget that puss? <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but anyway, they did a, a, a musical version with Jimmy Van Heusen and Sammy Kahn, a, a musical version of uh, Our Town with Sinatra, live. It was live on television, just like you'd have an opening on a Broadway show, only it was television. Full, complete story, you know, with a beginning, a middle, an ending, and music, Jimmy Van Heusen songs. Love and Marriage. Love and Marriage came from that show. and But when I saw the show, he showed me the Kinney. There wasn't one mistake. Every single thing was perfect on the show. It was just the, like like they edited it and made it just perfect. So it was a flawless show. So uh, the, the he's conquered all aspects of the entertainment field. That's why I call him the king of the entertainment world. He's actually conquered, really conquered every every phase of the, of the... But then he created what I consider the best fashion, his early music. It was the best fashion of music to listen to at that time. Every great jazz artist that you play on your station, that you play personally, when you hear um, John Coltrane, uh, you know, uh, you hear uh, Charlie Parker, you hear Billie Holiday, you hear Errol Garner, they're based on the tunes that Sinatra really gave kind of definitive versions of. There's many of them, you know, like I Remember You and the Trip on the Train. I Thought About You, yeah. I Thought About You, you know, all these wonderful songs that, you know, that really hang you up because they're, 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 they tell stories and they're so well written and and they, they hang. If you're a musician, of um, an American musician, you know, these songs just stay in your, they become part of your blood and your mind and your heart. Uh, here's that rainy day is really a national anthem for many, many great musicians like uh, Milt Jackson and and then the vocalists like Sarah Vaughan and Billy Eckstein. And, uh, we were all hung up on Sinatra, you know. That, that, that was the days where you, you bought your girlfriend a gardenia and you went to the movie house and and it was romance. It wasn't uh, erotic, you know. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was all about romance and and people being together. It it was the, it was it had a lot to do with uh, forming all the families together. You know, putting families together. Uh, family values. Family values. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, kept everybody in touch with with romance. So. You know, if you look at the history of music, you have Ravel. I happen to read his biography, and four times in his life he went out of fashion because the the mathematicians of music and physicists of the, that day, they mm-hmm. would say, well, that your, your music is finished, it's dated, you know, because now we're much more mathematical. And, and he would get angered. He'd tell them, look, if there's not one instrument in, the, in the, my orchestra that's p- playing with feeling, no matter what mathematics you figure out, there's no music. 
without feeling there's no music. Mm. And that's how he would answer them. But he would always come back. For, for, it was just, it's almost like... It's almost like the war between, in religions between the atheists and the religious. Mm -hmm. you know, all the Chinese wars were always really between the two factions. You know, is it, right. is it going to be no God or is it going to be a God? And th these were all the wars that were fought. Well, it's the same in music. You know, is it going to have feeling or is it just going to be some ma mathematical trick that sounds delightful but really kind of hits the wall? It's almost like modern architecture which is made out of plastic and glass instead of you know the old uh, great places like Carnegie Hall that uh, made out of wood and stone and like the Library of Congress in uh, in Washington DC you know mm -hmm. th that'll last forever no matter what fashion comes along well these songs and and the recordings and the live performances they're the true American artifacts I think it's interesting once you I remember you telling me that uh, you went to Carmen McRae and you asked permission to record It's Like Reaching for the Moon because you feel, felt that she was the, the keeper of the Billie Holiday songbook. And uh, the Frank Sinatra songbook, you, you, he sung everything. So, so really, everything well, is the Frank Sinatra songbook. I, I've got to explain that. Uh, I'd like to define what you just uh, mentioned. You see, years ago, the, before marketing, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I feel like a caveman or something. But before marketing, there was a game, there was an ethical game with singers of popular music. If you did a version, like for instance, to this day, I, I adore Billy Strayhorn's Lush Life. I think it's one of the great songs that were ever written for popular music. I still feel very funny about, I know I could sing it well, but I feel very funny about recording that because no one did it better than Nat King Cole. His record of Lush Life is really it. You want to hear Lush Life? That's the record to listen to. That's the one. Now, that was a game when I was just learning as a young pup on 52nd Street with Miriam Spear, who was my coach and lived in the brownstone across the street from Art Tatum and Lester Young and Billy Holiday and all the big Sid Catlett and all these great guys that were playing on that little strip on 52nd Street. And the game was that if someone did, you know, if Eddie Hayward did begin to begin, you know, boom, ba da ba da ba dum, ba da ba da ba dum, ba da ba dum, boom ba da 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 da, you know, and you'd hear this, you say, wow, what? that's his version. And, and no one tried to ape it. And no one tried to copy it, or no one tried to do what he did. You could be influenced by an Errol Garner, but if you just played like Errol Garner, in those days, you would just shot down. You're saying, well, you're just what Lester Young used to tell musicians. If you, do, if you imitate Joe Jones, you're just going to be one of the chorus. You know, play your own way. Don't play like Joe Jones. In those days, everybody had to be a complete individual, mm -hmm. and they were. And if you heard Ben Webster, it was delightful. You say, oh, that's Ben... As an audience, you participate. Say, oh, that's Ben Webster. You know, Art Tatum, Teddy Wilson. You know, you could hear the difference between each guy. And they were all mini monuments. You had a respect for all these wonderful artists. They were different. Mm -hmm. Carmen McRae sang different than Dinah Washington. Dinah Washington sang different than Peggy Lee. Uh, Peggy Lee sounds, uh, sounds different than Shirley Horn, you know. And this is what I like about popular jazz music. There's Ella Fitzgerald, you know, and then you put her on a shelf, you put Art Tatum on a shelf. There's certain ones, you know, just like Fred Astaire, you put them on a the shelf, they're just special. Then there's the rest of us, you know, and that's where, that's where it's at. That's, that's, and that's a game, and it's a very delightful game that has been diffused now. All of a sudden, everybody's doing everybody else's arrangements, not even... It's one thing to take a song. I mean, Les Brown used to take whatever. If a song was a ballad, he'd make it a rhythm song. Or if it was a rhythm song, he'd turn it into a ballad, Les Brown's band. I always used to enjoy his band because it was, it was ethical. It was a moral, there was a moral behind it. It had a, a you know, just like Woody Herman's Wood Chop His Ball. It was just, it was his record. One O'Clock Jump with Basie, that was his record. And uh, even though some other guys do it, it, it just doesn't sound as good as that original record. You know, it's that original record, and it's it was a it was a an age of individualism. 
where everybody contributed and everybody was respected for what they contributed. But today, it's all marketing, and there's a lot of terrific young performers out there. There's exceptions like a Michael Jackson, the way he dances, you know, and Madonna being the new Andy Warhol, you know, things like <laughs> that. You know, but what it's it's just I I liked the reason I liked it before. I'm not being nostalgic, believe me. I all I know is before there was a system that there were as many stars as the whole universe. It's the only country in the world, the United States, where the stars were there were so infinite. The amount of celebrities, you, you know, in England, you don't have that many celebrities. You know, if you do, they're not really that big. They're not that powerful. Or France or Japan. I don't know one star in Japan. You know, I don't. I don't know anybody who's an international star in Japan. They have all the money, but they don't have that. You know, they say, well, yeah, they, they don't have a Clark Gable, who was the king. You know, you say, oh, Clark Gable, he was the king. You know, you just look at him and say, that's it. So, that's what I love about our country. Without waving a flag, that, that, that it, you had this opportunity where, you know, just like my very commercial song, Rags to Riches, you know, you, everybody has a chance to make it in this country if you pursue it right and, and come up with something a little different. And I like that game. See, I think, I think the game still persists, but it's just c covered over by vast marketing by the money guys that just... Uh, you know, make someone popular for two albums, then make them go platinum, and then just get rid of them. Whereas years ago, if you made it, you had a longevity. You were able to last long. You could go on forever, you know, and just mm -hmm. play forever. Talking with Tony Bennett, I think one of the reasons that you have survived all these years is that by all accounts, and I can attest to this from our own personal encounters over the years, you are one of the nicest people in show business. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, I I feel a little embarrassed about answering that, you know, uh, um, not answering it, but uh, accepting that because there's so many good... I think all performers, no matter how hammy some of them might get or whatever, that there's something nice about performers wanting to make people feel good. Uh, you know, I like I, that's why I love performers. They, you know, you get a Cab Calloway and and uh, you know Lena Horn, and uh, they're all they all want to make knock people out of the seats. You know, make them forget their problems. And I, to me, there's something nice about their upbringing that made them want to do this. I know of many instances where you've given up your time and your name, and and even when you didn't want people to notice that you were doing good things for the community and for the music and for for musicians and so forth, but there is that special rapport you have with your audience. There's that wonderful moment that happens many times in your shows when you start singing a song and there's this immediate reaction from the audience and you just throw your arms out as if to say, here's my heart. Mm -hmm. It's it's just... Thank you. It's it's sweet and it's touching yeah. and... and yeah. And it's so... It, there's something wonderfully you know, romantic you, you about You said that. a good word there, you know, which uh, is dangerous. It's uh, called sweet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that goes back to the original question you you asked me about Sinatra. You know, that was a sweet era. You know, you had Dick Ames, you had Bob Eberly, had Helen O'Connell, and the music was sweet. Uh, it wasn't uh, sickening sweet, you know. It wasn't like, you know, it was real sugar instead of sweet and low or equal, you know. <laughs> it, it, there was a, a niceness about it. Charm. There was a charm... You know, if you take a song like Sweet and Lovely, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a dynamite song, but the marketing, the producers today, they'll just say, what, what the heck are you singing? This is an old song. What are you singing this for? But if something is nice, you know, there's something powerful about it when it comes to light entertainment, popular music. And uh, that, that brings me to uh, talk about uh, niceness. Uh, you know, uh, Nancy Wilson and I, uh, with Woody Herman, did a television show that actually started and motivated the, the great cable show, Arts and Entertainment Now, that's on permanently on television. We were the first ones to inaugurate the station. I never saw it. That's the most promotion I've ever received. 
In every single town, they played it six times with full-page ads across the whole country, unlimited budget promoting it and everything. And it was a dynamite show from Lake Tahoe. And uh, I was very happy to be part of that show uh, with uh, Woody Herman and, uh, and Nancy Wilson. Uh, we did a special for Arts and Entertainment, and that uh, kicked up all the subscribers to the show. And uh, now it's a permanent show. And now you're back together again. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah, it's did you nice. sing duets on that? Is there any duets? We, we didn't, actually, no. No, we were just part of the show, and it was just that, that kind of show, and it was with Woody Herman and... That is missing sometimes in show business now. Nowadays, it seems in the old days, even in jazz, there was more jamming or, or people who were on the Absolutely. same show. Just You all know the same songs. They were all Do friendly. a couple of them together. You know, yeah. you know. Uh, years ago, you're so right. You know, that's another thing. Not that there aren't a lot of nice people around today, but people really helped one another. I'm not, I'm not talking about a utopia now. I'm not that there weren't problems in those days. But if you were a young artist... The agents, mm -hmm. managers, they would say, "This is a this is a diamond in the rough. Let's let's uh, let's hone this and let's let's work on this and and uh, and then he, he he or she will become very good." Mm -hmm. uh, today, that's that the agents and producers are like insurance men. They want it finished. They they don't want it. I just brought a, a wonderful girl that I heard from Atlanta. She's a very nice lady. Her name's Evelyn White. Uh, she's a black piano player. Elegant, you know, nice straight back, beautiful black lady. And uh, plays original, has her own style playing the piano. She's young. She's very young. She's about 26 right now. And a very good family, you know, uh, her father's a doctor, and you know she comes from a good family, and she plays beautiful. She plays at the uh, Niki Hotel in Atlanta, in the lobby. And I was doing a concert at Chastain Park. I wait a minute. I heard her playing, and I said, "God, listen to this woman just sitting here in the lobby playing this piano." So uh, my girlfriend uh, Susan Crow, you know, I said, "You should li listen to this girl." And she says, "There's a demo made." And very nice. She sings and plays, and it's like she doesn't imitate Nat King Cole, but she sings and plays, which Carmen McRae always says is so difficult. People don't realize how difficult it really is to play and sing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And she does it quite well. She does it in the tradition of Jerry Southern or Nat Cole. She's got her own style, though, and she's very good. I mean, I would just automatically, as a manager, I would say, go for it. You know, she's 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 wonderful. I took her up to a big jazz company, a very famous jazz company, which will remain nameless because I don't want to get anybody, put anybody down publicly. And they, they heard it and they said, she's good, but come back in a year when she's all finished. And I, I just, it's just a different area. They, just, <laughs> they want the, finished. They want, yeah, when they, they want a finished product. They want something that's there right now that's going to be right all finished so they could just collect. They don't want to go through the struggle of just saying, hey, this girl's good, you know, give her a break, put her over here, you know, make a record with her, let's see what happens, you know, and that, that's how I started. I had, when I first went over to Columbia Records, you know, they, boy, they really took a chance with me. I mean, they, you know, I was a young Italian kid that uh, my knees were knocking, I, but someone, you know, Mitch Miller and, and Percy Faith, they said, this guy's got something. Let's just, let's just keep working on him. There's something there. And then they kept surrounding me with great musicians. And God had evolved into like singing with Count Basie and Gene Kruber and Bill Evans and Ralph Burns and Stan Getz. And, you know, I had the greatest musical adventure I could ever dream of. But and someone gave me a break. And you're not finished yet. Not finished. No, I'm just starting <laughs> out now. Just starting out. I'm 66 and I'm on the Billboard pop charts, you know, and... And the jazz charts, I can't believe it. You know, it's just, it's, it's phenomenal. I'm, I'm so fortunate, you know. So, uh, But I mean, I was just trying to bring out that give these young kids a break, you know. It's like George Burns says, years ago you had a circuit where they could go from town to town and learn, you know, how to, they had to get lousy before they got good. That's how he phrased it, which is quite humorous. 
He says they, they had to get lousy before they get good. And then by the time they come back to New York, they're ready. Because they played all these gigs. But today there aren't any gigs. There's not enough gigs to go around. Yeah, places to fail. Exactly. houses. Exactly. Now when you fail, you fail in front of 20 million people on some show and your career is over. <laughs> That's right. They'll see some young rock kids that look wonderful because they have all the energy and they're handsome and, you know, and uh, they... And they they'll go out there and uh, and put them in a big rock show, and for the first five minutes when you see them on TV they look like wow what a terrific group this is you know and then then but then you put them in in front of people because they don't have that seasoning of going from town to town they're repetitive and they don't have any nuance and change of pace and all the little know hows and tricks it takes ten years to learn how to walk on the stage right. You don't just uh, you don't just become an instant star. No one does. And Michael Jackson started when he was three years old or whatever. You know, and that, that's why he's so good now. It takes years to learn how to really be a good performer. Well, you've been good for a long time, and uh, oh, I, I think it's great. I think what's happening in Newark right now is fantastic. All this this cultural uh, viewpoint of, of of building it up, you know, and. I think you're going to get a lot of people from New York eventually to to uh, go over the bridge, and uh, even though there's a huge audience in Newark, you know, a huge audience, uh, there's many shows in New York that the majority of the audience is from Newark. That a lot of promoters have told me that sometimes there's as much as 40 percent in the audience are from Newark that come into the city, and I think it go the other way. If you have uh, great jazz rooms, uh, beautiful lounges, um, concert halls, performing arts centers. There's plenty of people that wouldn't mind taking a break that live in the city that would like to take a break and go over the bridge and you know, go through the tunnel and get over to Newark and see some shows there. Well, let me ask you one other thing. I always ask people to give me five records. Name five records that are important to you, that you like, records maybe you return to when you're feeling down, and those five records will make you feel good the five records you might have mm -hmm. to have on a desert island. Mm. You can answer it any way you like, but sure. I want you to name five records that okay. really are important to you. Or you uh, I would I would say uh, uh, the Gil Evans Sketches of Spain with Miles Davis. Why? Uh, I, my first uh, recording, Gil Evans uh, did the arrangement, was one of the arrangers. I had the most, it was so funny because it was quite a, a musical crime what happened because Tony Tamburello, the late Tony Tamburello, was from Kearney, New Jersey, you know, and he was my coach and steered me in the right direction. And uh, the first album I made it called Tony uh, was the second album I made. I did the first one with Chuck Wayne and a terrific guitarist and wonderful person. But the second one was big time, so-called big time, and they, they brought, you had Neil Hefty, you had Gil Evans, you had uh, Ralph Burns, uh, you know, uh, Marion Evans, you had all these wonderful orchestrators, and they all did a, a take. So the first, I'll Be Seeing You, the song, uh, Sammy Fain's song, was written by Gil Evans, and he had the most respect in the music world in those days and still does uh, by musicians as uh, the, the most advanced, the most creative orchestrator. He, I had a drummer, Billy Exena, who was with him in the Claude Thornhill band. And Gil Evans did those arrangements right. for Claude Thornhill, Snowfall and all this. But wonderful. what about sketches that is, appeals to you the most is that like well uh, of course it just as a the, the, it was the anti it's a it's a thing about it was a salute to Pablo Casals and uh, privately I'm I'm very interested in humanity and uh, Pablo Casals left Spain uh, with the with the dream that once Franco died, he could go back to Spain. He moved to Puerto Rico. As long as, as long as Franco was in Spain, he would not live in Spain. Picasso did the same thing. Picasso moved to France, waiting for Franco to die. 
because that was the father and the bed of fascism. Mm -hmm. And they were so against that, you know, anti-humanity viewpoint uh -huh. that they made a political statement. And Blues of Pablo is a, a magnificent contribution uh, so showing how wonderful it was of the greatest music teacher and the greatest one of the greatest musicians that ever lived mm -hmm. to make this statement, the country that he loved and based all his music on, he was forced to leave until Franco died. Ironically... That's on Miles Ahead. That, that, yeah. yeah. And ironically, uh, Franco lived longer than Pablo. He ne was never able to get back to, s to Spain. He outlived both Pablos. Mm-hmm. Picasso also. Yeah, yeah. That's one. Okay. The narration with Louis Armstrong... And song of what a wonderful world. Uh, I'm I'm waiting for some president of the United States to be that powerful and make that strong a statement about what America is really about. That's that's every time I hear it that gives me the, the greatest goosebumps. You know because it's uh, well, uh, you know. What a phenomenal performer, Louis Armstrong. What a genius, you know, just a genius of, of, I can't even describe what a human being he was, you know, he's so great as a musician, but then also as a person. I think it's curious that when I go out to Shea Stadium, they, they have the sign pointing to the Louis B. Armstrong Stadium, and I said, was that our Lewis? Is that our pops? They said, "Yeah, I never heard the B." I never did either. I never knew there was a B. In his I didn't name. realize that myself. But you know how the, everything is formal if you're going to name yeah, a stadium very, after yeah. somebody, it has especially to be with the airplanes flying over. Yeah, it. <laughs> it's called a pop stadium. That would have been fine. <laughs> we didn't know yeah, pops, like, pop yeah. stadium. You know? That would have been. All right. Well, now that's two. You got three more. Uh, the Bill Evans album with Symphony Orchestra. Forget the name of it. Uh, he did interpretations of classical music. Oh, yes, on Verve. Yeah. That one, uh, Stan Gets His Focus. Andy Sauter. Yeah. What about that? What about that? It really appeals to you. Well, those two? there's certain records that I've had in my life mm -hmm. that I play over and over again. I just find myself, if I paint, you know, I just put that on and everything's all right. You know, I could listen to it all day. And uh, those two albums, the, 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 uh, the Bill Evans album with cl the classical orchestra, and Klaus Ogelman, I think, was there. Mm -hmm. it was the, uh, and then Focus with Eddie Sauter and Stan Getz. And those two albums, somehow I, just, I could just put them on and play them all day long. I, I could just hear it over and over again. Um, Sinatra's We Small Hours of the Morning. Why that one over all the others? That was, uh, I, I think it was just the saloon song philosophy of that album. You know, it was just uh, they all, they all, they hung you up. I mean, you listen to them; they just, it just was so well recorded, uh, so relaxed and and sane. There was just a saneness about the music and the way Sinatra sang. It was, it was just very nice and relaxed, and I could just listen to it over and over. Once again, I liked also the Lu the Fred Astaire album with Oscar Peterson because a lot of people don't realize, but Astaire introduced all those songs. They were written for him. There were composers, the composers that I love, that would not have anyone else introduce a song. They were all like that: Berlin, Gershwin, Kern. Harold Arlen, they would not want a song to come out until Fred Astaire introduced it. That's how much respect they had they had for Astaire. And sure enough, he did them just the right tempo and just the right way. And and uh, they be, they became they they're the most important songs. The songs he introduced that were his songs as as an interpreter are the songs that are the most powerful. I think down the line a thousand years from now will be the most important traditional songs of, of the American songbook. 
This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org/studios.